Um, today's speaker is Eugenia Chang, an accomplished mathematician. She's going to present um, on her book, Beyond Infinity, and I'll say more about her in a minute. This is in our series um, on science. Our Monday, uh, Sunday morning platforms tend to touch on a, a topic like um, science or ethics or the arts or something, and this is part of our science um, sort of series. Eugenia um, is an accomplished mathematician who has turned her considerable talents towards demystifying math for students at all levels and for the general public. She integrates her love for cooking, for music, and for engaging with people to make abstract math concepts accessible to lay audiences. Check out her segment with Stephen Colbert in which she uses puff pastry to illustrate the notion of exponential growth. It is very fun. Um, she has a PhD in pure mathematics and has been on the faculty or visiting lecturer at several uh, universities in Europe and the US. She is currently a scientist in residence at the School of the Art, Art, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she um, is teaching high-level abstract mathematics to art students. She also runs the Lieber Stuba, a, a nonprofit that she has founded to take classical music to a wider music uh, audience. Today, she's going to be talking about her, her most recent book, Beyond Infinity. Some of you may recognize her from when she was here a few years ago to talk to us about her first popular book called um, Baking with Pie. Right? Is that the Oh, how to bake pie. Sorry, I should have written that down. Anyway, thank, uh, join me in welcoming Eugenia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for all for coming out here on this snowy morning. And thank you to the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago for inviting me back. It's always very nice to get invited back to somewhere. Because <laughs> you think that you didn't do something too terribly wrong. Even though you're talking about abstract mathematics, which isn't something that usually you think that people will want to listen to on a Sunday morning. So it's great that you're here, and I'm very happy that you do want to listen to it. So I am going to talk about infinity. And you might say, why infinity? And what has infinity got to do with anything? And the thing is that infinity is a wonderful place to think about thinking. And it's a wonderful place to understand how to think and what can go wrong if we don't think quite clearly enough? We have many examples in the world at the moment of what can go wrong when people don't think clearly enough. <laughs> infinity, one of the reasons I love talking about infinity is because it's something that even very small children can get excited about, but even the, the most brilliant mathematicians can't understand all of it. So there's a huge possible journey in between first thinking of the idea and trying to understand all of it. So I'm glad to see that there are many young people here today. And that along this journey, from first thinking about infinity to trying to understand how to think about it logically, we get to see all sorts of strange creatures and interesting mathematical undergrowth. And for me, that's what math is about. It's not about trying to solve problems and find answers. It's about exploring the world of logical thought that we can have inside our brains. And math is all about thinking logically. And in fact, my next book that's coming out later this year is called The Art of Logic in an Illogical World. So it's really all about that. But the book about infinity is really also about that. It's not really just about infinity. It's about how to think. Now, I started thinking about writing this book when I was called in to arbitrate a fierce argument between my four-year-old nephew and his best friend about whether infinity is a number or not. And his best friend said, infinity is not a number, and I know that because my daddy says so, and my daddy's a scientist, so he knows everything. <laughs> and my nephew sensibly focused on proving that his daddy does not know everything by starting to list facts about Batman that his daddy didn't know. <laughs> so is infinity a number or not? The, qu the, the answer is, well, it depends. And in fact, in math, often the answer isn't yes or no. The answer is, it depends what you mean. And really, that's often the answer in life as well. It's not that one person's right, and it's not that one person's wrong. It's just that there is some sense in which this person is right, and there is some sense in which that person is right. And if we saw things like that, then we might be able to have slightly less divisive arguments and slightly less yelling at each other. I can dream, right? <laughs> now, I do research in a field of abstract mathematics called higher dimensional algebra. And people often ask me, what, higher than what? 
And the curious answer is kind of higher than three, because it turns out that after three, it might as well be infinity, because it's so difficult. And this happens in life as well. A friend of mine was counting the homemade jars of jam she had left in her cupboard from previous years of jam making. And she told me that she had, she had something like 11 from 2014. Oh, no, it was, she had one from 2014, six from 2015, 10 from 2016, and many from 2017. Because after 10, it was just many. And you, you couldn't, sort of couldn't count them. So there's a question about what numbers we really think about. And my friend Amaya Gabancho, who is a Basque literary translator, told me that in Basque, the word for 11 is the same as the word for infinity, Hamaika, which I find very interesting. And she hadn't really thought about it until I started talking to her about infinity. It was just something that she had completely internalized as a native Basque speaker. Now, my first inkling of infinity was when I was very small, and the house I grew up in had rooms that went in a circle around a central fireplace. So it, was a, a, it wasn't a very old house, but it was sort of traditionally constructed with a fireplace in the middle and all the rooms on going around it so that they could, in theory, all be heated up by the fireplace. And that meant that we could run around in circles through all the rooms, round and round the fireplace. So I would chase my sister. We would chase each other round and round in circles. And then we would change direction suddenly and go the other way and have hysterics or maybe crash into each other round the back. And to us, it felt like we had an infinite house. Because when you can run round in circles, that's much more interesting than running backwards and forwards across a room. And those loops are one of the first places that I think I saw something about infinity. Because in a way... We don't have anything infinite in our life, really. Or do we? I'll come back to that. But one way we do is if we have loops. And in fact, the math department that I used to work at at the University of Cambridge and the one at the University of Nice, they had loops built into the buildings. And you could often see mathematicians just walking around and around in circles, <laughs> thinking. Because it's nice to go for a walk to think, but if you go too far, then you're really far from home. So it's nice to go in a loop, because then you're not too far from home. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about loops, paradoxes that arise if you think about infinity, but don't do it quite right. I'm going to talk about the infinitely big. I will talk about what infinity is really, because there are some ideas about what infinity is, but they don't quite work as we'll see from the paradoxes. But mathematicians have come up with ways of talking about infinity in a way that does work logically. I will talk about dimensions, because I do work in higher dimensional, infinite dimensional algebra. And finally, I will talk about the infinitely small, which is the flip side of the infinitely large. So first, loops. I've talked about loops a little bit already. But the next loop I remember seeing when I was little was my favorite computer program. My mother, who is mathematical, taught me to program on a computer when I was very young. In fact, I think I was four, and I was amazingly good at programming for a four-year-old. And then I never got any better, so I'm still about <laughs> like a four-year-old. And one of the reasons I never got any better was because I did not get bored of writing my favorite program over and over again. And my favorite program is this. 10, print hello. 20, go to 10. <laughs> and then you hit run, and you get infinite hellos going across your computer screen. And I found this infinitely amusing and could just do it every day forever. So I never really developed my programming skills beyond that. Another way that we can get loops is through the wonderful uh, introduction we had with the infinite song at the beginning, because the song went in a loop, which is why it was an infinite song. So it was a wonderful way to start. And another way I like is where we can sing around. So if we sing around, then we can make a very interesting loop, because it starts off building up differently, but then once it gets around the back, we get to make the loop. So how about we sing this round? So let's do it in four parts. So if we try to take people over here in the first part, people here in the second part, people here in the third part, and people here in the fourth part, and let's see how we get on. So we'll start maybe about here, ready? Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat. 
row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat. Gently down the stream. the rest of my talk, we'll just keep doing that infinitely. <laughs> so I built a little model of, of that. So what happens is that you start singing, row, row, row your boat. And then when you get to here, the next people come in. So at this point, you have two lots of people. And then at this point, the green people come in. And then you have three lots of people. And then at this point, the orange people come in. Now, if we didn't go in the loop, it would just be like this, and it would fizzle out. But because we go in the loop, the red people start again, which is a very high-tech demonstration. <laughs> the red people start again. The yellow people start again. The green people, oops. The green people start again. The orange people start again. And then we see how we get into this stable state where each section is the same. It's just that the, the who is singing what has changed, but overall what is being sung is the same. So then it can go on forever in this loop until we decide to stop and break it apart. There are some very interesting rounds that twist. And so their stable state is actually a Merbius strip which is the one where you twist it in the middle, and that's very curious. But we won't do that right now. What we will do is talk about the paradoxes that arise if we think about infinity in a slightly too floppy way. So we can start thinking about what happens if we try to make our chocolate cake last forever, for example, by eating half of it and then eating half the rest of it, and then eating half of the rest of it, and then eating half of the rest of it, and so on. We'll never finish, right? Because we'll always have a little half left of what's left, sort of. Of course, in practice, the last bit will become so small that we'll just eat it in one go, or maybe we'll, we just won't be able to see it anymore unless we get a microscope out. But um, another paradox that arises that I quite like is Hilbert's Hotel. So this is a different one about counting infinitely many people. Hilbert said, imagine that you have an infinite hotel and the rooms are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, all the way up forever because it's infinite. So imagine now it's full, but one new guest arrives. So what can you do? Well, you can move the person in room 1 into room 2, and you can move the person in room two into room three. And you can move the person in room three into room four, and so on. And everyone will have a room to move into because there are infinitely many rooms. And that will leave room one empty, and the new guest can move into room one. So you can just move everyone up and add an extra person to Hilbert's hotel. Now, this, is, this isn't exactly wrong. But what it tells us is that infinity works very differently from finite numbers. Because in a finite hotel, you can't do that. But in an infinite hotel, you can. Hilbert's paradox was a very, quite recent relative to mathematics, a couple of hundred years ago. Zeno's paradoxes show that mathematicians have been thinking about infinity for at least 2,000 years. And Zeno was an ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician, and he came up with many paradoxes about infinity. And they were framed in the language of everyday life, but they weren't really trying to be questions about everyday life. They were questions about how we think and how we deal with movement and cutting things up into small pieces. So the first one is about Achilles and a tortoise. So Achilles is very fast. And tortoise is very slow, and the tortoise is very clever. So the idea is that the tortoise is clever, and Achilles is a bit stupid. And the tortoise challenges Achilles to a race, a foot race, but he says he's just going to have a, a bit of a head start. 
And so what happens is this. Achilles starts here. I'll come down here. Achilles starts here, and the tortoise starts there. Now, by the time Achilles has reached the place that the tortoise started, the tortoise has definitely got a bit further forward, maybe to there. And by the time that Achilles gets to here, the tortoise has still got a bit further forward, maybe to there. And by the time Achilles gets to here, the tortoise has got a bit further forward, maybe to here. And by the time Achilles gets to here, the tortoise has got a bit further forward. So every time that Achilles gets to the place the tortoise just was, the tortoise has gone a bit further forward. So that means Achilles cannot ever overtake the tortoise, right? No, right? That contradicts what definitely happens in life. So what has gone wrong with our thinking? The next one is the question of the chocolate cake, although Zeno didn't state it in terms of chocolate cake. <laughs> he stated it in terms of traveling from A to B, where he said, first you have to cover half of the distance, then you have to cover half the remaining distance, then half the remaining distance, and so on, so you never get there, right? No, we do get to places every day. You all arrived here. I make it to my fridge several times a day to eat chocolate cake. <laughs> And the, the third one that's curious is that nothing is moving. Well, because he says, in any given instant, nothing is moving. He didn't frame it like this, but if you take a photo, the photo isn't moving. Everyone in that instant isn't moving. Which means he talked about an arrow in flight. So he said, if you watch an arrow in flight, at any given instant, it's just in one place, not moving. So that means nothing is moving. So how come everything is moving? So these paradoxes show that we have to be more careful when we think about infinite things. And we can do one of two things. We can go, oh, that's stupid. That shows that math is stupid and doesn't work in normal life. Or what I like going is going, ooh, this is interesting. Something weird is going on. I want to understand what weird is going on. And I think it's a bit like staring over the edge of a cliff. If you see, if you see an edge of a cliff, real cliff, some people want to go to the edge and look over it. I do not when it's a physical cliff. But when it's an intellectual cliff, I want to see, because I think there could be something really interesting over the edge. And that, for me, is the draw of exploring mathematical worlds. It's the things that could be just on the other side, especially where something weird is going on. To me, it's like an optical illusion. I love optical illusions. And I love the weird, floaty feeling of not understanding quite why the illusion is happening. Or even when you do understand why the illusion is happening, still seeing the illusion. And to me, a lot of math is like that. It's an intellectual version of an optical illusion where something weird happens, and I enjoy that weird, floaty feeling. And I always want to encourage people to try and enjoy that weird feeling, because I know it can be off-putting to feel that weird and confused. But to me, being confused like that is an opportunity to become more intelligent. The solution to these paradoxes took 2,000 years, which is pretty amazing when we think about the demands that are currently made on researchers in terms of how applicable their research is supposed to be and the time frame in which it's supposed to have a concrete application. So 2,000 years is way out of what we're supposed to do now. But eventually, mathematicians came up with a way of dealing with infinitesimally small things and the fact that in some circumstances, you can add up infinitely many, infinitely small things and get a finite answer. So apart from loops, that is another way we access infinite things in real life because actually, there are infinitely many things in this room if we're allowed to count infinitely small things because there are infinitely many, infinitely small things in this room. Now, that might sound like just a loophole or, a, or a, tr a, a stupid trick of mathematicians, but it led to the field of calculus, which is what enables us to understand and control everything that moves. And so everything in the modern world is controlled by calculus. Anything using electricity, anything using automation, computers, everything involves calculus. So it all came from these bizarre and abstract sounding thought experiments that didn't seem to have relation to real life. Here is a picture of me eating infinitely many cookies. <laughs> I made this batch of cookies by making the first cookie with a tenth of the cookie dough, and then the next cookie with a tenth of the remaining cookie dough, and so on. So how about the infinitely big? That was the infinitely small. 
How big is infinity? Well, I start to think about what a million looks like, and there's this fantastic book, I don't know, some of you may know it, called A Million Jelly Beans. I think that's what it's called, and my nephew, my, I gave it to my nephew, and it, it talks about how many jelly beans do you think is a reasonable <coughs> number of jelly beans? And they gradually add up, well, what if I eat 10 jelly beans a day for a year? What if I eat 10 jelly beans a year for 10 years? And there are these pictures of bigger and bigger numbers of jelly beans. And the last page, spoiler alert, the last page is a fold-out page and a picture of actually one million jelly beans. And it's really amazing just to stare at it. It's about this big. So I try to make a million dots on my computer screen. Here's 10. Here's 100. Here's 10,000. After that, my computer gave up. My computer's a bit pathetic. It said not enough memory and stuff like that. So this is 10,000. It's already quite a lot. It's hard to contemplate how big a million is. But infinity is, of course, bigger than all numbers. Infinity is more than how many people there are on Earth, or ants, or germs, or cells, or molecules, or atoms. There isn't a million of anything. I mean, there isn't infinity of anything unless we think about infinitely small things. But this doesn't tell us what infinity is. It only tells us what infinity isn't. So what is infinity? Well, one time I was helping at a primary school, an elementary school in, in England, and I was helping six-year-olds with math. And I love helping six-year-olds with math because mostly the idea of math phobia hasn't set in yet. And they get really excited, and when the teacher says they're going to do math, they will jump up and down and scream with excitement. And when they ask, the teacher asks questions, they will stick their arm in the air and they want to answer. And then somehow when we get them at university and they're 18, we ask them questions and they all go... <laughs> So I was, I was thinking about symmetry with two little kids, and we did a triangle, and we did a square, and we did a hexagon, and all those things, and drew the lines of symmetry on. Then I drew them a circle. And I said, how many lines of symmetry does this have? So one of them drew this one, and one of them drew this one, and one of them drew these, and one of them drew these, and one of them drew these, and on it went, and then one of them went, oh, there's hundreds of them. And then the other one went, no, there's thousands of them. And then the other one went, you could spend your whole life drawing them and you would never finish. And then the other one picked up a pencil and colored in the whole circle and said, I finished. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the day going, what happened? <laughs> and I think one of the amazing things about math and infinity is that even small children can have really profound thoughts that are difficult for us to understand. And that can make it daunting for adults to answer their questions about math because you might find you don't know the answers. But that's okay, because even mathematicians don't know the answers. So a circle has infinitely many lines of symmetry. So there is somewhere that infinity comes up, sort of in real life. Infinity is also a way of winning arguments. Because you can say, well, I'm right times 10. Well, I'm right times 100. I'm right times a million. I'm right times infinity. <laughs> or is it a way of winning arguments? Because you might say infinity plus 1 is infinity because infinity is the biggest thing. But then if you subtract infinity from both sides, you get 1 equals 0. That's not that great. And you could do it again. You could say infinity plus 2 must also be infinity, but then 2 equals 0. And then you end up getting that everything equals zero. <laughs> and even worse, you could say, surely infinity plus infinity is infinity. But then you could subtract infinity from both sides of that and get infinity equals zero. So what has happened there? Is this all wrong? Well, there is a world in which everything equals zero. It's the zero world. It's not that interesting, but it does exist it, abstractly. And in fact, it's a very important world Overall, it's just that you can't do very much in it. It is the world of candy that I lived in when I was little because I was allergic to all the artificial food coloring in candy. So no matter how much candy anyone gave me, I still effectively had zero candy. It was very sad. So, oops, it's okay to have everything equal zero, but it's not ideal and it's not a good model for our actual world of numbers. So what can we do instead? Well, infinity is not an ordinary number. And so the answer to my nephew's argument with his friend is, well, it depends what you mean by number. Infinity is not 
a natural number, those are the counting numbers. It's not a real number, that's the, all the numbers including the decimals. But mathematicians have come up with cardinal numbers and ordinal numbers in which infinity can exist. And the idea there is that the thing that made it go wrong was subtraction. So we say, okay, let's invent a kind of number where subtraction doesn't work normally, and then that will avoid that problem. And what we do is we basically go back to basics and think about how we first taught numbers to children. So what is five? Five is the number of fingers on your hand. Ten is the number of fingers on two hands. So numbers are, you take a set of things that characterize that number, and you go, the number is that thing. And so infinity is how many numbers there are. So five is the number of fingers on a hand. Ten is the number of fingers on two hands. Infinity is the number of numbers. But we have to be careful what kind of number. It's the number of whole numbers that there are. And it turns out that that just gets around all of the problems. You don't have to say exactly what it is. You say, I know what the set of all the whole numbers are. It's one, two, three, four, up forever. However many that is, that's infinity. And if you can match up any other set of things with the, num the whole numbers, then it's infinity. So it turns out that that's only the first infinity. And there's a whole hierarchy of infinities that get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is one of the weirdest things about infinity. Because the first infinity is how many guests fit into Hilbert's hotel. But then you can start thinking about infinity in slightly different ways. Because remember that in order to fit another guest in, we had to move everyone up a room. That's kind of a hassle. And if you care about having caused all your guests some hassle, then maybe you don't want to count that as the same because you've caused them all this hassle. So if you care about hassle, then 1 plus infinity is different from infinity plus 1. So 1 plus infinity means one guest arrived first, and then infinity guests arrived afterwards. And you can fit them all in without having to move anybody. But infinity plus one is where infinity guests arrive first, and then one more guest arrives. And you can only fit them in by moving everyone up. And that is different. So if you care about hassle, infinity plus one is actually bigger than infinity. And that is why I think Shakespeare said in The Taming of the Shrew, if this be not that you look for, I have no more to say, but bid Bianca farewell forever and a day because he knew that forever and a day is longer than forever, because you have to wait through the whole of forever and then another day. <laughs> An even bigger infinity is how many decimal numbers there are, it turns out. So the decimal numbers, we're including all the ones that go on forever, including the ones that never repeat, the irrational numbers. There are a lot of those. And there's a very clever proof called the Cantor diagonal <coughs> argument that says if you try to fit all those into a hotel with rooms labeled one, two, three, four, you would never be able to fit them all in. There would always be at least, you can find one that was left out in the cold, which means that this infinity is bigger than the other infinity, which is quite a weird fact, and you may feel like your brain is exploding. So the real numbers are all of those, the whole numbers, the decimals, the rational numbers, and the irrational numbers. And there turn out to be more irrational numbers than rational numbers. So the rational numbers is the same infinity as the whole numbers, and the irrational numbers is a bigger infinity. And in fact, there are more irrational numbers than rational numbers. There are also more irrational people <laughs> than rational people. And I think now it's probably time for a pause to digest some of that. So I'm going to have a musical interlude with one of my favorite songs, The Infinite Shining Heavens, which is on a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, set to music by Vaughan Williams. Thank you. 
dimensions, and my favorite thing, higher dimensions. Does four-dimensional space exist? Well, in our normal life, we only have three physical dimensions. But if we think about ideas, then we can have as many dimensions as we want. Now, here is a picture of a four-dimensional cube, sometimes known as a tesseract. To see how this is a four-dimensional cube, we can think about how we build up cubes of different dimensions in the first place. So to make a two-dimensional cube, that's a square, you take a line and a line and you join them up. And to make a three-dimensional cube, you take a square and a square and you join them up. So to make a four-dimensional cube, you take a cube and a cube and you join them up. So here's a cube, here's another cube, and then you join up all the corners and that's how you get a four-dimensional cube. And that just like in a three-dimensional cube, there are different pairs of faces. So on a three-dimensional cube, there are three dimensions. So there are three pairs of parallel faces. On a four-dimensional cube, there are four dimensions. So there are four pairs of parallel cubes. So that's just one pair of parallel cubes. If you look at it this way, that's two different pairs of parallel, and one different pair of parallel cubes. There's another one here, and there's another one here. And I like staring at these things. And, well, is it useful? Is four-dimensional space useful? Does four-dimensional space exist? Well, you may know that one of the great insights of Einstein's theory of relativity was that if we include time in the three-dimensional space, we can regard it as a four-dimensional space-time. And it turns out that that idea gives rise to so much new insight about the world around us that it's very useful. It does lead people to sometimes think that four-dimensional space is space-time. That's not true. Space-time is an example of four-dimensional space, but there are many other examples of higher-dimensional space. One is, possibly, music. How is that a fourth dimension? Well, I like to think of dimensions as ways you can escape. So if you're stuck in one dimensional a one-dimensional world, it's like you're on a train that's on a train track that can only go backwards and forwards. And if somebody wants to catch you, all they have to do is put a block in front of the train and one behind it, and then the train can't move. If you're in a car, a car can move in two-dimensional space, and if someone wants to catch you in two-dimensional space, then they need to put a whole circle around you. But then if your car was a James Bond car and you could press a button and turn it into a plane, then you could go into the third dimension and use the third dimension to escape the circle, and you could get back on the other side. So if you were then in a plane, someone would, you'd be moving in three dimensions, and if someone wanted to catch you, they'd have to put a net all the way around you. So in order to escape, you could time travel. So you could use time as the fourth dimension. You could time travel to yesterday when you were not caught inside the net. Then you could move outside the net and time travel back into today. And, or you could... So this is why a musician said to me, could music count as a fourth dimension? Because if you're stuck somewhere and you listen to music, you sort of feel like you've escaped. <laughs> now, I don't think you really have escaped, but in a way you've escaped. So I don't know, maybe that counts as a fourth dimension. I like that idea. Vital statistics are another way that we have four dimensions. If we try, if I go to the doctor and they, they alas, weigh me and, and take my, they, they measure my height, they weigh me, they take my blood pressure and they take my pulse. And that's already four pieces of information. If you count blood pressure as two numbers, then that's already five pieces of information. So if they wanted to draw a graph of everybody's vital statistics, they would need five dimensions to put all those in. So every time you add another criterion to something, that's another dimension. So we're thinking about higher dimensional space all the time without realizing it. My arm seems to be moving around in three-dimensional space. But actually, if you were going to specify exactly where my arm was, you'd have to give me a lot more data than the three dimensions because there's the hinge at my shoulder telling me whether my upper arm is flapping around like this. There's the hinge at my elbow telling me how my arm is bent like this. There's the rotation. There's the flapping of my wrist. There's the rotation of my wrist. And so there's actually a lot more coordinates determining where my whole arm is as opposed to just the end of my fingers which are moving around in three-dimensional space. And one example of how this is different is if you try and apply sun cream to your own back, then you're like me, you go like this, and then you get stuck here, so then you have to go all the way around, and then you have to go like this, and then you hope 
that you meet, the place you get to here meets the place you get to here, or when you get sunburn and a little strip across your shoulders. And so what's happening there is that my hand here is very close to here in three-dimensional space. But in the seven-dimensional space of my arm movement, that's a very long way away. And this is very relevant to robotic arms because, for example, if you're doing keyhole surgery with a robotic arm and you need to move something from here to here, you need to know whether the arm needs to go like this in order to get to there, as opposed to just moving like that. So you need to know where it is in the whole higher dimensional space of the arm, not just the three dimensional space at the end of the arm. And so the, the study of higher dimensional space is very much used in robotics where they're controlling lots of different hinges of robots. So I mentioned criteria earlier, but every time we assess something, it's not just if we write down numbers, if we just think about, say, what restaurant we go to eat at, we might compare restaurants, first of all, according to how much we like the food, but then also how much it costs, and also what kind of ambience we want, and also what the service is like, and also how healthy it is, maybe, and also where it's located, and how good the parking is. And once we've taken all those criteria, we have made a higher dimensional space of restaurants, although we just don't usually think of it like that. So we're thinking in higher dimensions all the time, or we should be. Often, we reduce everything down to some very boring one-dimensional situation where we just give something marks out of 10 and declare that instead of being a nuanced human individual, we're going to reduce everything to one dimension, which I think is a shame. So, for example, when you're thinking about going on holiday, the one-dimensional part of it is just how you get there. But a two-dimensional part is comparing different ways of getting there. And then a three-dimensional part of it is comparing the ways of comparing different ways of getting there. So you might say, well, it's cheaper to take the train, but it's quicker to fly. And then you might think, well, is it more important that we save time or money? And the same is true if we evaluate, if we're comparing books, we might get into a stupid argument just saying, this book's better, no, this book's better. And you can translate this to other aspects of arguments in life, where one person just yells, this one's better, and the other one person yells, just this one's better. So if we actually thought about what criteria we were using, that would be more subtle. So you might say, well, I think this one's better because it has a better plot. And then someone might say, well, that one's better because it has more interesting characters. And then you can be more subtle, and you can say, well, that's that, well, that was comparing the different criteria. And then you compare the ways of comparing different criteria. You can say, well, is it more important to have a better plot or interesting characters. And there are many things in life where it's not that one thing is better than the other, it's just that here are the senses in which this thing is better, and here are the senses in which this thing is better. Now let's compare those senses. But of course, that takes much longer than a 140 character tweet, or maybe even a 281. So these arguments tend not to happen anymore, but I wish they would. So the, the moral is that more dimensions gives us more nuance. So, back to my infinite cookies and the infinitely small, we might wonder whether we can declare one divided by zero is infinity, in which case, what is one divided by infinity? Is it something infinitely small or is it zero? So, there are many ways we can access infinitely many things by getting smaller and smaller, and one of them is fractals. So, fractals are, things, are pictures where if you zoom in on them, they look the same after zooming in. So here is a, a, a fractal I'm going to build up called the Shapinsky Triangle, where you remove the middle of a triangle. Now you can do the same to all of those triangles that remain. So I'm going to remove the middle of each of those triangles. Now I can do the same to each of the remaining triangles. And I can do the same to each of those remaining triangles. I think that might be as far as my computer managed to go. But in theory, you can keep going to infinity. And then, in order to really zoom in and keep it being the same, that will give you infinitely small triangles. Oh, it went one further. So you could also make an infinite tree where you take two branches and then you split each branch in two, and you split each branch in two, and you split each branch in two, and in two, and in two. I think that might be as far as it went. Oh, it went one further. So now, if you zoom in on any particular branch, it looks the same as the whole tree and has got infinitely small. Oh, it went one further. So you can draw your own fractals. I like drawing fractals, so this is something everyone can do at home. 
This is called the Shpinsky Gasket. Now, you can draw more perfect ones on a computer, but you can draw ones that you did yourself with a pen, and I like that. So you just start by drawing a circle, and then you put three circles. It's a really good circle. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, you see. So then you fill in three circles that touch the sides, and then you find the biggest gap there is, and you fill it in with a circle. And wherever you see a big gap, you fill it in with a circle. And you find that as you keep going, the things that previously looked like big, small gaps start looking like enormous gaps. Like this one now looks enormous. And so as you do it, your brain is abstractly zooming in. And this is what our brains are capable of. That we can think at big levels, and we can also think at small levels. And the important thing is to be able to do both rather than getting stuck at one level or another. And I find this also quite soothing. <laughs> so, well, maybe we can keep adding to this later. So it's less perfect than the ones you draw on the computer, but it depends what you mean by perfect. I think this one is more perfect. <laughs> you can also use mirrors to create infinite images. This is me in a hotel somewhere where I thought, oh, I can make an infinite picture of myself. You can also make an infinite selfie of yourself. <laughs> this is called the drop effect, where you have a picture of yourself in a picture holding that picture, then it goes to infinity. And these are all infinite things also created by self-reference. So when something references back itself, you make a loop that can create infinity. And so we get back to loops. So, in fact, this whole talk has been a loop. Because we're now back to loops. And I would like to say that, apart from that computer program, there's also loops that you can make in anything that refers to itself. And I'd like to finish with a poem that refers to other pieces of art, that refer to other pieces of art, that refer to other pieces of art. It's called The Fall of Icarus, and it's by José Bersarionandia. And also, to go back to the beginning, it's been translated from the Basque by my Basque literary translator friend, Amaya Gabancho. And the poem refers to this poem, landscape, this painting, with the fall of Icarus. And you can just see Icarus here. He's fallen in, but everyone's kind of just going about their daily lives. So this is the fall of Icarus by José Bessarionandia. If I had to choose a poem, I'd be by W.H. Auden. The one called Musée des Beaux-Arts, which mentions Peter Bruegel's The Fall of Icarus, where Icarus is but a tiny, almost invisible figure falling into the sea. The old masters understood suffering well, says W.H. Auden, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. Everything turns away walks away quite leisurely, oblivious practically to the disaster. The pain of someone's life almost never touches someone else. Almost no one cares for the wounds of others. The English poem references a Flemish painting. The Flemish painting, a Greek myth, and the Greek myth, who knows what? I'm by the window waiting for Icarus to fall. I'd get a good view from here, as the clouds float northward, soft, docile, without a care in the world. If he falls, his wings will hit the antennae on the roofs. There's danger in those power lines, too. If we were to join in everyone's suffering, life would be impossible. But I'm waiting for Icarus, and I'm going to help. I'll collect the pieces of his broken wings, and give him shelter when he falls the way I fell, like a chicken. Thank you. It's so great to have you back, and there's just so much um, stimulating uh, material in my brain. Is, it is just kind of going <laughs> crazy right now. Anyway, um, what does a pure 
mathematical research, what, what does your day look like when you're doing research? Ah, oh, when I'm doing research, I look like this. <laughs> Sometimes it looks like I'm asleep, but I'm definitely not. <laughs> but I do find that I have to hold myself on the edge of sort of consciousness and dreaming because you have to access a very imaginative part of your brain to imagine things that are completely out of the realm of normal life. And so sometimes I lose my grip on it and I do fall asleep. It's true. <laughs> And if I lose my grip the other way, then I start thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch. So it's a very delicate balance. You mentioned that after the number three, it might as well be infinity because it's so difficult in terms of higher dimensions. Is there, uh, there's always been a mysticism about the number three. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I think that the number two is easier to understand because there's just a one-way interaction. And there are some mathematical reasons that three is harder. For example, the three body problem is a long-standing famous problem about when you have three planets interacting with each other, it's very difficult to work out what, how they will work. Whereas when you have two planets interacting, it's quite simple. And so somehow having three makes, it, makes things that much harder. Whether there's that some reason for a mystical connection, I don't know. I think that there's, something, there's also something physically interesting about three because triangles are rigid in a way that if you have just two things joined together, it's not, you can't balance. So if you're building a, a structure, if you add diagonal pieces of wood or whatever it is, then the whole thing becomes rigid because a triangle is rigid, where a square or a, four, a four-sided shape isn't. And there's also the fact that if you have a three-legged stool, it can always be stable because three points, as long as they're not in a straight line, three points always lie in a plane, whereas four do not. So four... For a four-legged stool is in a way less stable, despite the fact that most of our chairs are four-legged. That's for other reasons, because if you rock backwards and forwards, I suppose, then that makes a three-legged stool less stable. So there are some mathematical reasons that three is very different. Um, and maybe that relates to why they have, there's some mysticism about it. I don't know. It was a wonderful talk. I'm kind of curious or uh, stimulated by fractals, and I'm trying to figure out what is, does the concept of fractals make available to either us or to mathematicians or to other thinkers? Uh, fractals have, I'm not a huge expert on them, but they have found, um, found they have popped up in the study of chaos. So chaos is a part of mathematics that it's not completely chaotic, but it's so close to being completely chaotic that it, it's a, the kind of thing where a, a butterfly flaps it wing, its wings and it causes huge changes in climate across the world. Because a very slight change in data at the beginning can cause huge changes somewhere else, which means that because we can never achieve total accuracy in reading data at the beginning, it's almost as if it were random because we can't tell if we had been slightly off, something totally different would happen. But inside chaotic systems, these little patterns of the sort of fractal sort of appear as if by magic. They appear in places and then they disappear. And then they appear over there and then they disappear. And it's quite strange. But it's, if you look at pictures of it, you can see, um, if you look at pictures of the wind across the earth, it'll look very random, but then there'll be little swirly things in places, and then they'll just dissipate, and then there'll be little swirly things. And I think it's related to that. Also, it's really beautiful. So if you Google images of fractals, you'll get millions, infinitely many, maybe, <laughs> pictures that are just amazing to look at. They're just beautiful, I think. Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you've ever been asked an infinite question, and if so, did you give an infinite answer? Sometimes questions sound like they're going to be infinite, <laughs> which is why they should have question marks at the end. Um, it was kind of sublime to see you connect the idea of infinity to art, especially in the poem at the end. Can you say a little bit more about how come the School of the Art Institute uh, wanted to have a scientist in residence? And 
what you do. Yes, uh, isn't it wonderful that they want to have a scientist in residence? And thank you. And I think a lot of the it started. A lot of the impetus for starting it was because um, the president before the current president was was a Professor Walter Matthew, who is a very renowned physicist, and he has been at the forefront of physics outreach and bringing science to people, especially from underprivileged backgrounds and people who are not white. And part of that, his being president, met, was meant that he particularly wanted to make sure science became part of art and that art becomes part of science because they're not really different. And so there's a big draw for art and science and for conversations in art and science. And it was when he was president that it, there was an idea to have a scientist in residence because, of course, nowadays at science institutions, they quite often, if they are enlightened, they have an artist in residence because they know it can be valuable to have an artist provide artistic interpretations of the science to help bring that to a wider audience. And so they decided to flip it on its head and have a scientist in residence at the School of the Art Institute, which I think is a wonderful idea. And as soon as I heard about it, I thought, this is my dream job. <laughs> and so I seized it. Do you believe in the existence of parallel universes? Um, that is very interesting, and I recently read a book about quantum physics that was the first time I felt like I thought that quantum physics was plausible, because I've never been able to understand the thing about making an observation and then suddenly something splits between two things, but there's a new theory that actually I don't know if it's very given very much credit by physicists, maybe if there are some physicists in the room they can tell us, but where in fact all of the alternate universes are there all along, it's just that our path happens to be on one. And to me that makes more sense than just one of them suddenly appearing randomly rather than the other. I think the, the possibility that, that, that all of the different universes are all there, it's just that our path, like on the fractal tree, we take one path along the fractal tree and not the other paths. So, it's one of those things where it's an abstract concept, so in a way it doesn't matter if it's real or not. What matters is whether we can think of it, and we can, and that's one of the amazing things about our brains, that there are so many ideas we can think of, regardless of whether we can touch them or, they're, or if they're real or not. And to me that's powerful. It can seem like it's removed from life, but I think that thinking about those possibilities sheds light on the life that we do interact with. So, uh, thank you for a wonderful program. I'm thinking about what I encounter when I listen to or read the news lately, and that is a lot of statistics about projected deadlines. How long do we have, you know, before the oceans rise? I, I don't need to give you the list. Um, so I wonder what the theory of mathematics has to say about deadlines? <laughs> well, math underpins all of those theories because mostly it's based in statistical models. And those deadlines are all about probabilities. So it's not saying this is when the deadline is, but what is the range of likely deadlines when something will happen? And most, most predictions that happen aren't saying this is definitely going to happen, but it's saying the range of possibilities of what will happen is this. Just like when Google Maps tells you it's going to take 36 minutes, what is really true is that there is a range of possibilities and it might take you less and it might take you more. And that if you've used Google Maps a lot, you know to allow for the fact that it will probably take you more. <laughs> and, but, but unfortunately, again, because the current world is all about sound bites and one second attention spans, it's too complicated to say, well, here is a distribution of all the possibilities. So people are pressurized to come up with one number, and we're always pressurized to cut, sum everything up in one number, like how many marks out of 10 does this have? When is the deadline? When is this going to happen? And scientists can be pushed into saying those things, or the media can interpret scientists' very reasonable statements about distributions into a catchy headline, which is never what the scientist said. But the problem is that if a scientist says, well, it might be this and it might be that, then to people who don't understand how science works, that sounds like they don't know what they're talking about because, because other people like to believe in certainties. 
And so it's one of the reasons I think it's so important for us to make sure that everyone is better educated in the understanding of logical thinking and scientific understanding and what scientific theories are so that we can start understanding whole ranges of probabilities instead of having to be dumbed down into a single number. Uh, thank you very much. You have an excellent talent for taking complex ideas and bullying, bullying them down to concepts that lay people can understand. And um, I'm going to actually put you on the spot because I'm a, I study the brain and statistics of the brain. And one of the ideas and statistics of the brain right now that's really popular is thinking of activity in the brain as a manifold in high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And I cannot, for the life of me, think of a way to uh, boil that down. Oh. And, and, and I've been struggling with it for a while. So I was wondering if you'd like to take a step at it. Um, so a manifold is a way of thinking about a large structure in terms of sticking together small structures, which is really just like how we understand the, the globe. So we have, we understand a map of Chicago, and we don't have to put it on an entire spherical globe every time we go about Chicago. But if we want to go somewhere further around the globe, it's important to understand how those little pieces of flat map stick together to form a whole globe. Because there are many different ways to stick flat things together to make different shapes. You could make a huge flat plane by sticking little flat things together. You could make a sphere. You could make the surface of a donut, which is a torus, which is another manifold. So the key is two things. It's the little pieces you're sticking together, but it's also how they stick together. So that was two-dimensional manifolds because each little piece we're sticking together is two-dimensional. So if you take a higher dimensional little piece and stick them together, you can imagine how many more ways there are of sticking them together to make globally interesting structures. And what I imagine is true is that the brain has so much activity of different types that there are so many different pathways that things can go that they stick together in different ways to make higher dimensional, really complicated, looped up shapes. So I didn't know that that was the case, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> Hi, um, your presentation was amazing. I just have a quick question regarding zero and infinity. Yes. So zero, I've been doing some reading and there's a, a concept where zero is actually a spot of, um, in terms of creation, opportunity, infinite possibilities mm -hmm. instead of being a void or negative or a lack of options or or the the null factor right uh -huh. you talk somewhat about zero math for a little bit mm -hmm. can you maybe talk a little bit more about the possibility or is there a possibility for a grander relationship between zero and infinity than most would perceive there to be uh yes okay thank you um there are other, so many other ways of just dealing with infinity mathematically that I didn't talk about. But another one is where you just declare that you want there to be a point at infinity. And you want it precisely to have that relationship with zero, where if you divide by zero, you get infinity, and where if you divide by zero, infinity, you get zero. So you just make a world like that and see what happens. And this is the wonderful thing about math. If you want something to happen, you can just invent a world and see what happens. So. As long as you don't cause a contradiction, it's okay. If you cause a contradiction, then the whole thing collapses and you've gone back to the zero world. But it turns out you can add a point at infinity like that and it doesn't all collapse. And this is called the Riemann sphere. And the idea is that if you take um, the ordinary real line of numbers, it's just a line and it goes infinitely far in this direction, infinitely far in that direction. If you add a point, one point at infinity, that kind of joins up that point with that point because it, it's gone to infinity in both directions. So it kind of joins up and makes a circle. And the reason that Riemann sphere is called a sphere is because it's actually done with complex numbers. You may not know what complex numbers are, but that's where you decide that you also want to, to take square roots of negative numbers. That takes you off in a different direction. So if you do that, you get a whole two-dimensional plane of numbers. And if you add a point at infinity to that, then the whole outside of that plane gets joined up to one point. I like to think of it as like when you make a dumpling. So you take your sheet of dumpling, and then you take all the sides and you pull them up to the top. And that's the Riemann sphere. Uh, hi. Uh, I got uh, a couple of questions. Uh, well, it's a two-layer question. Uh, the, historically, there's been a lot of math and art that's gone down. M.C. Escher, uh, the perspectives, uh, uh, drawings. Um, even uh, uh, Salvador Dali was familiar with uh, the atomic uh, issues at the time. How, how does that uh, entail with what you're 
what you do to, to present to the students today and what, if, what effect does your current thinking have on, on their, their work at the Art Institute? Thank you. I, one of the things I most, there are so many things I love about teaching at the Art Institute, but one of the things I love is when students take the math that they've looked at in the class and they start using it in their art practice elsewhere. And I love it when they show me the art that they've done that has been influenced by the ways of thinking in math because we're not just doing numbers, we're doing ways of thinking. And the art students love thinking. That's what they love doing. They don't want to solve specific problems or, or find numbers, and they don't want black and white answers. They want to think about things and understand them better and then interpret them to show the world what they're doing. And so when they've used mathematical ways of thinking to do that, it's great. Um, I don't do a lot of specific artwork in the classes because I am teaching math, although at the moment I've just started a new class on mathematical secrets of music as well. But, uh, so that's quite fun. Um, but I do show them, we do talk about Escher a little bit when I talk about paradoxes because I think paradoxes are like intellectual optical illusions and Escher made visual optical illusions. Um, but I've decided that <coughs> talking to my art students about it, we came up with this way of thinking about how art and science are related because I think that science is about understanding the world and that art is about interpreting the world. But in order to understand the world, you have to interpret it. And in order to interpret the world, you have to understand it. And so really, it's just part of the same process. Easy breezy question. What, um, what were some of your favorite books when you were like nine and 10 years old? Just a few. Oh, um, well, they weren't mathematical. In fact, I didn't read very many math books when I was little because no one ever told me that they were, there were math books. But also I had many, many interests. So when I was nine and 10, let's see, I loved Asterix comics. I found, and I still read them because every time I go back, I get more and more insight about humanity and clever jokes because they work at so many levels. They're hilarious stories, but they're also profound, ironic commentaries on human life. I also really like detective books. And I think because it kind of, stimulated the logical part of my brain to try and understand what was happening and how it was happening. So I've always liked Agatha Christie, and I always liked Jane Austen as well. So I think I started reading Jane Austen when I was about 10, and I still read them. I read all of Jane Austen every year at least once, the whole lot, because I love them so much, because I think they tell us a lot about human nature, and because they're so poetically written, I can just enjoy the words. And they're also wry, really wry. I like that. It's not about math, my question. Um, it's more about the political of minorities getting into math and science. What uh, you said, mentioned you were advocating that, or do you know any groups are advocating? My wife's a teacher, and she, every day, talks about sometimes there's no interest in it because it's not practical. But the thing is, it comes the practicality of math is seen when, you, when someone shows you, shows you the passion like you showed today, and show that it's not something out there, it's something that happens every day. Mm -hmm. So well, how can someone go about that or is there something at Art Institute or something that you know about? To get more people into math? Especially minorities. Among artists? I think that... Minorities. Minorities. Oh, minorities. Minorities, yes. Oh, oh. Please, thank you. Um, I think that it's obviously a very big question because there are broad social issues that come into play <clears throat> and that, that the access to mathematics is part of the broad social issues to do with that. I think that having more um, role models to, to show that it is for everybody is important. And when I was younger, I didn't want to be a role model because I thought that, that everyone should know that women can do all the things that men can do and that therefore, and that, that non-white people can do all the things that white people can do and therefore we shouldn't need role models. And I still think that's true. We should not need role models, but we do. And eventually, I look forward to the world where we don't need them anymore because everybody knows that everybody can do everything. But unfortunately, at the moment, not everybody knows that. But part of the issue is that men don't think women can do everything and white people don't think that non-white people can do everything. And so we have to change everybody's views and have role models not just for the minorities but also for the majorities to see that the minorities can do all those things. I think that there are still some cultural problems. In some cultures, my students tell me that their fathers tell their daughters that math isn't for them, 
or their fathers tell them that, that they'll never be as good at math as their father. And this is horrifying to me, but it shows that we still have a lot, a lot of work to do. Um, and I think that catching people when they're young is important because like all stereotypes and prejudices, they're learnt. Babies are not born with that. And so if we catch everyone before that starts, then I think that's important. We can try and change it after it has set in when people have become adults. And we should try and do that as well. But to catch people when they're five and four and three and show that it is for everybody and that there don't need to be any barriers to entry. And I think that in a way, math is one thing where there really don't need to be because you don't need expensive equipment and you don't need expensive access to anything. All you need is an imagination. And if you have an imagination, then you can access all of it. You don't have to beg your parents to buy you the Star Wars Lego set or whatever. As soon as you have an idea of something you want to play with, you can just play with it. And to me, that is something that should make math infinitely accessible to everybody. We just have, we have to work very hard to change attitudes around it. And I think it is possible to change attitudes. This, oh, this is going to be our last question, and it's from a retired science teacher, so watch it. <laughs> Thank you for the headache. Uh, if I'm thinking, my head hurts. So uh, some of the most famous people on, 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 in humans in history have constructed these box, boxes, the, the relationships that are true. And then the people who are really, really well-known are the people who think outside the box. So what's more human, to stay within the box or to stay with out of the box? And what's more valuable? What's more human? And what's more human? Um, what, uh, what's more capable of, that, that makes humans so special to be able to think outside of the box or to construct the box? I think, as someone said over here, both. I think that it's what's important about humans is that we're all capable of different things. And the most important thing, I think, is flexibility to be able to do different things and not decide that only one thing is good and that only one thing is best. Because that is a recipe for exclusion and it is a way that, that traditionally people have kept their power by excluding other people from it. And unfortunately this happens plenty in math that some people derive all their self-esteem from being able to do something that other people can't do. So they don't want to let anyone in and they want to keep defining that as what is most intelligent. Whereas I derive my self-esteem from being able to explain those things to other people and bring them in. And so I believe in bringing people in rather than keeping them out. And I hope that you all do as well. <laughs>